No one group of people in history suffered as much oppression for so long as women did. In every country in the world and in almost every civilization, women were given secondary status to men and forced to either accept it or to rebel and be condemned by society. Only a century ago in America, women had no rights at all. They couldn't vote, chiefly because men believed they weren't educated and informed enough. Yet higher education was denied them. Only one college in the United States allowed women admittance. There were no women doctors or lawyers, and of course no women legislators. Married women literally belonged to their spouses. If they earned money either through work or inheritance, that money was legally their husband's and not their own. Women who did work were often paid half of what men were paid for the same job. Besides the legal restrictions on women, were the social restrictions. Much of what men were allowed to do was considered inappropriate for women. Single women weren't even expected to go out without a male guardian by their side. The way women talked, dressed, behaved, and even the way they thought was all strictly regulated by the standards deeply embedded in the society. With the exception of ancient Egypt and Rome, this deprivation of legal and social rights had been the fate of women since the beginning of time. But in the 19th century, all that began to change. By the 1800s, the question of women's voting rights finally became an issue, and the struggle was particularly intense in Great Britain and America. In the mid 1800s, women in Great Britain and America began a movement for women's equality that eventually swept most of the globe. For the first time, they organized, defined their goals, and launched a campaign for public and political support. In 1848, women in the United States released their first written set of demands. It included a woman's right to, in their words, have personal freedom, to acquire an education, to earn a living, to claim her wages, to own property, to make contracts, to bring suit, to testify in court, to obtain a divorce for just cause, to possess her children, and to claim a fair share of the accumulations during marriage. There was not even the mention of a right to vote, but that would soon follow. It would follow largely because of the work of a spirited and tireless woman named Susan B. Anthony. Susan Brownell Anthony was born February fifteenth, eighteen twenty, in Adams, Massachusetts. Her father was a Quaker, and although he was flexible about his religion, Susan grew up dressing in the austere clothing of Quakers and speaking in the traditional thee and thou. Her mother, Lucy Reed, was a Baptist. But she adopted most of the Quaker customs when she married Daniel Anthony. Both parents believed in the equality of men and women. Daniel Anthony was an intelligent, intellectual man with liberal beliefs. Some from the Quaker community, some all his own. He ran a mill that was sometimes prosperous, sometimes not, but always required his full time and attention. As a result, Lucy Reed ran the household and farm by herself. A demanding job since she had eight children plus the mill hands that frequently boarded in the Anthony home. The children learned responsibility early, sharing in the chores and sometimes helping their father at the mill. Since Susan was the second oldest, many of the tasks fell to her. Daniel and Lucy Anthony believed strongly in educating their children, boys and girls alike. Susan was precocious and could read and write by the time she was only three years old. In their early years, the children were taught by a governess at home, but as Susan progressed, she was sent to an elementary school. She marched off full of hope and eager to learn more. The hope soon turned to despair. The first thing she noticed at school was that the boys were given more attention than the girls. They were called on to answer questions and recite more often, and were given special privileges and bonuses. But worst of all, they were allowed to study arithmetic. And girls were not. Susan loved arithmetic. She was full of envy when the boys went into a corner with the teacher to review their math lessons, and she and the girls were left behind to continue their reading and writing. When she summoned the courage to ask her teacher if she too could take math, she was told that girls didn't need it. When she entered her teens, the Anthony sent Susan to a girls' boarding school near Philadelphia, 
with the intimidating name of Miss Molson Select Seminary for Females. Once again, she found the curriculum focused less on intellectual development and more on conformity in behavior. But before she could rebel, she was called home after only six months on a family emergency. In 1838, when Susan was 18, the United States was hit by the worst financial crash in its history, and thousands of people went bankrupt. Among them was Susan's father, who was forced to move to a town in New York aptly called Hardscrabble. He owned land there and hoped to make a living as a farmer, although that plan later failed, and he took work at a life insurance company. Susan was recruited as assistant manager of the farm, work that proved rewarding because it gave her the opportunity to meet and talk with some of her father's guests, many of whom were active in social reform. It was in these penny-pinching days on the farm that she gained a different kind of wealth, information, knowledge, and the awareness that there were serious social injustices in America, and there were people who were working to correct them. She was exposed to the ideas of many of the leading reformers of her time, including Frederick Douglass, who was a frequent visitor to the Anthony home. Anthony once remembered, Mr. Douglass always brought along his violin. He liked to play it and sing, and we were happy listening to him. Between the singing and the playing, however, was a lot of talk about slavery, abolition, and politics. At the time, Douglas was publishing a newspaper that demanded immediate freedom for the millions of slaves throughout the South. Northern businessmen resented him, fearing he would threaten their lucrative trade with the South, and he had endured much ridicule and harassment. Anthony admired his cause and his fighting spirit. In the time she spent on her father's farm, she decided that she, too, would become an activist for social change. As the Depression continued and her father's farm failed, Susan set about trying to figure out how to give financial help to her parents. There are two events that can occur in a society which, although unfortunate, often have the beneficial effects of giving women greater independence and opportunity. One of them is war, and the other is a depression. In this depression of the early 1800s, many women, like Susan, began to think for the first time of finding a way to make a living and support themselves. Susan chose a safe profession for women, teaching. Her first job was as an assistant principal of a boarding school in New Rochelle, for which she received a salary of $30 for 15 weeks of work. When her term was over, she took a post as a teacher in a country school, taking the place of a man who was paid $10 a week. She was given $2.50. More teaching positions followed until Susan worked her way up to principal of the girls' department in the Kanajahari Academy. She was now a young woman, tall, with broad shoulders, inquisitive, and energetic. During these years, out on her own with freedom and spending money she'd never had before, Susan began to break away from her Quaker upbringing. She took an avid interest in politics, committing herself first to the cause of abolition and freeing the slaves, and then to temperance, the campaign to abolish alcoholic beverages. Although temperance seemed like a rather puritanical cause today, in the 1800s, heavy drinking was a serious social problem, with repercussions in the family and the workforce. While she campaigned for these two causes, Anthony also had her mind on the many inequities she'd seen in the employment of women, both in her teaching profession and at her father's mill. As yet, she was unsure what to do about the problems or how to approach a solution. There were other women, however, who were about to find a way. In 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott held the now-famous Seneca Falls Convention, nicknamed the Hen Convention by male critics. It was the first organized attempt to bring women together to discuss their oppression and come up with a proposal for action. The goal of the meeting was to focus on social, civil, and religious freedom for women. Anthony heard about the convention from her family, which always kept informed about reform movements, and decided she would attend. While taking a walk in Seneca Falls with a friend, she was introduced to Elizabeth Stanton. It was the beginning of a friendship and working partnership that would last over 50 years. 
At first, however, Anthony wasn't interested in joining the women's movement and decided instead to put her energy into the temperance fight. She joined the Daughters of Temperance, a local organization, then battled her way up to the state level. Abandoning her teaching job, she founded and devoted herself full-time to the Women's State Temperance Society of New York. Anthony had no particular speaking abilities, but over the years she trained herself to become a forceful, dynamic orator. She also learned to be a persuasive writer. But her greatest assets were her organizing abilities and her phenomenal energy, which never diminished in over 60 years of political campaigning. It was her work in the Temperance Society that finally led Anthony to the women's movement, not because of any affinity between the two groups, but because of her troubles with the men in temperance work. There, just as she'd found in schools, the men called all the shots. They wouldn't allow the women to work side by side with them, refused to let them do any public speaking, and relegated them to behind-the-scenes paperwork. Anthony, as dedicated to the cause as the most dedicated man, became frustrated and impatient. She was beginning to listen to her friend Elizabeth Stanton when she told her the fight for women's rights was the real fight. It was the issue that affected every other. Finally, exasperated with her restrictions in the temperance society, she shifted her heart and energy for the final time to the cause of the emancipation of women. One of her first goals, because of her own personal experiences, was to reform the education system. She campaigned for women's rights in the New York Teachers Association and forced through a vote that allowed female teachers to share in all the privileges and deliberations of the organization. By the time she was in her 30s, Anthony was committed full-time to the women's movement. At first, she played a secondary role to Elizabeth Stanton, who was older and had been leading the movement for years before Anthony arrived in the scene. But gradually, she became the guiding energy and intellect in the group. They were in some ways an unlikely pair, even to look at. Stanton was short and plump, with twinkling eyes and curly hair. Anthony was lanky and angular, with a serious expression and spectacles. But they shared brilliant minds dedication, and the courage of conviction. For much of this time, Anthony lived with Stanton and her lawyer husband so they could work together more efficiently. They wrote speeches, organized local groups, drafted petitions, and went on the road to try and drum up support and help raise women's consciousness. It was a demanding life, particularly so for Stanton, who was also raising seven children. Frequently, it was Anthony who stayed home and took care of the children and household chores so that Stanton, who was a better speaker, could go campaigning. Anthony was dubbed an old maid by now. In those days, women not married by 30 were considered to have missed their chance. Most were married by their early 20s at the latest. She was ridiculed by male opponents, as feminists often were, as having adopted the women's cause because she was so unattractive to men. This, of course, was absurd. In truth, Susan B. Anthony had many suitors when she was young, but had been put off by the institution of marriage itself, which she felt doomed women to a life of drudgery and confinement. She came to feminism, as all the early crusaders, from a genuine sense of injustice and a burning desire to liberate her gender. In the 1850s, Anthony and her colleagues found a uniform to express their cause, Bloomers. Bloomers were really loose trousers gathered at the ankles and worn underneath a dress. They were named after the feminist Amelia Bloomer, a friend of Anthony's, who publicized them in the paper she edited at Seneca Falls. The beauty of the Bloomers was that they replaced the tight, uncomfortable corsets women had been locked in for generations. Thus, they became a symbol, a protest against not just constricting clothes, but constricting attitudes. Women in the 1800s put on bloomers in much the same spirit that women in the 60s took off bras. When Anthony donned her bloomers, she also cut off her luxurious brown hair as further protest against stereotypes. Unfortunately, the bloomers were too effective. She, like other feminists, found that the public was paying too much attention to the costume and not enough attention to the issues. Young boys in particular liked to follow women wearing bloomers and repeat the popular and derisive chant, 
Jibbery jibbery gab. The women had a confab and demanded the rights to wear the tights. Jibbery jibbery gab. Distressed by how her fashions had become more important than her words, Anthony went back to the bulky layers of long skirts and petticoats. In the year 1866, Stanton and Anthony founded the American Equal Rights Association in order to work for women's suffrage. The early work in the women's movement was slow and frustrating. It was held back by lack of funds as much as from opposition. To Anthony, the root of the problem was obvious. Few women had money of their own to donate to the cause. She decided it was time to take the issue directly to the state legislature and force a bill that would alter the status of women, at least in New York. Right off the start, she told the legislators that she would be back every year, year after year, until such a bill was passed. And that's exactly what happened. Every session for ten years, the legislators expected Anthony at their door. And every session, she was there. For all those years, she lobbied tirelessly, traveling about in all kinds of conveyances and weather, spending long nights writing and working over tedious details, and journeying to other states where women had taken up the crusade. Then, in 1860, just as the nation was about to head into a civil war, fought for the rights of another minority group. New York passed a law making the first changes in the status of women. It stated that a married woman could control her own property, her own earnings, would have joint guardianship over her children, and would be granted many of the other economic demands Anthony and her colleagues had fought so hard for. Inspired by this victory in New York, women's groups in several other states began campaigning for similar bills, many of which were enacted. Throughout all her campaigning, Anthony had to endure vicious and often personal attacks by the media and by opponents. The New York World described her as lean, cadaverous, and intellectual, with the proportions of a file and the voice of a hurdy-gurdy. A Detroit reporter wrote, "If all women's writers look like that, the theory will lose ground." Anthony maintained her dignity throughout these attacks and was far more concerned with the assaults on the issues themselves. The New York Sun scoffed. What are the rights which women seek? The right to do wrong. Many a woman slammed the door in her face too, snapping, "I have all the rights I want. I have a husband to look after me." So much opposition was there that in some towns Anthony was denied the use of meeting halls. One thirteen-year-old girl who went to hear her recorded in her diary, "Susan B. Anthony talked very plainly about our rights and how we ought to stand up for them." And said the world would never go right until the women had just as much right to vote and rule as the men. I could not make grandmother agree with her at all, and she said we might better all of us stayed at home. Grandmother wasn't the only problem. The press and the legislators were an even bigger problem. One lawmaker wrote in response to her efforts, "The ladies always have the best places and choices tidbits at the table." They have the best seats in the railroad cars, carriages, and sleighs. The warmest place in winter and the coolest in summer. If there is any inequality, the gentlemen are the sufferers. When he read this to the legislators, the entire room burst out laughing. With the start of the Civil War, Anthony found her thoughts divided between women's rights issues and the issues of abolition. The radical abolitionists, with whom she'd once worked, opposed Lincoln's election at first because he was trying to prevent the war. They wanted immediate emancipation and saw the war as the only way this could happen. But soon she broke away from the abolitionists, chiefly because most of them refused to support women's rights. Once, a well-known abolitionist named Samuel May, who resented her attempts to attain legal and financial rights for married women, said to her. You are not married. You have no business to be discussing marriage. She responded, "You, Mr. May, are not a slave. Suppose you quit lecturing on slavery." As the war raged on, women decided to call a moratorium on their own campaign for equal rights. Anthony retreated to her father's farm to wait out the battles at Fredericksburg, Antietam, and Gettysburg, so she could resume her own battles. But in the meantime, she suffered a painful and unexpected defeat in the New York legislature. The legislature, taking advantage of the moratorium on women's rights efforts, 
suddenly voted to repeal part of the law that voted in only two years earlier, the part about women's guardianship over their own children. Anthony felt betrayed and helpless. Her frustration was made even worse by the dullness of farm life after so many years of activity and challenge. She wrote in her journal, "Tried to interest myself in a sewing society, but little intelligence among them. To keep her intellect sharp." She read the novels of George Eliot and poetry by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, but mostly she waited. The wait was over in 1863 when President Lincoln released his Emancipation Proclamation, giving feminists a new forum for their own issues. If slaves can be freed, women can be freed, said Anthony. If this is a government by the people for the people, then those people must include females. With Stanton at her side, Anthony organized large numbers of women to fight for a constitutional amendment abolishing slavery, an issue they felt was deeply tied in with their own. An amendment for black people could surely be followed by an amendment for female people. Stanton and Anthony gathered so many signatures they ended up playing a key role in the passage of the Thirteenth Amendment, which abolished slavery in America. But when they read the follow-up amendments, the fourteenth and fifteenth, they were filled with despair. These amendments stated that civil rights were to be given to all citizens who were male. If not for that one word, all citizens, black and white, male and female, would have had the same rights at one stroke in one amendment. But the word remained, and the amendment passed as written. Abandoning her work on a national level, Anthony returned to New York and started campaigning for women's suffrage, the right to vote, on a state level. It was during this period that she had her famous exchange with the powerful newspaper publisher Horace Greeley. He said to her, "Miss Anthony, you are aware that the ballot and the bullet go together. If you vote, are you prepared to fight?" She responded. Certainly, Mr. Greeley. Just as you fought in the last war, at the point of a goose quill, Greeley was one of the leaders in the campaign to stop Anthony and block the efforts for votes for women in the New York State Legislature. There were discouraging years for Anthony, in which little noticeable progress was made, and the opponents always seemed to have more power, more money, and greater access to the public. In response, she decided to fight back on their terms. She started her own weekly newspaper called Revolution. It was a little smaller than one of today's tabloids and bore the motto: "Men, their rights and nothing more; women, their rights and nothing less." The paper had been financed by a wealthy benefactor named George Francis Train, but shortly after it started, he was thrown into prison in England for supporting the cause of an independent Ireland and was unable to send her any money. She worked day and night trying to save the paper, soliciting subscriptions and possible backers. She even went to the White House to ask President Johnson to buy a subscription. She complained later, "I waited two hours in the anteroom among huge half bushel spittoons and terrible filth, where the smell of tobacco was powerful." When she did get in to see the president, he showed no interest in signing. But she hammered away at him until, as she reported, he signed his name Andrew Johnson with a bold hand, as much as to say, "Anything to get rid of this woman." In spite of the president's subscription and in spite of numerous loans, Anthony couldn't keep her paper afloat. When she had to close it in 1870, she was so disappointed she wrote, "It was like signing my own death warrant." By the time she suspended publication. The paper had gone ten thousand dollars into debt. Anthony took the responsibility of the debt entirely upon herself, saying, "I will work with might and main to pay every dollar of this honest debt." She spent years paying it off, mostly with her public speaking fees. Throughout the many years she worked on women's rights, Anthony lived barely above the poverty level. She had only a small inheritance left by her father and whatever she could earn on the lecture circuit. In addition, she gave much of her money away to women who couldn't afford to travel to the conventions and lectures of the organization. All this time, she was also writing a massive book entitled *The History of Woman Suffrage*, on which she collaborated first with Stanton and later with two other feminists. When it was finally completed, it consisted of five volumes, 
the organization which she and Stanton were leading together was given the name National American Woman Suffrage Association. It held a convention every year for 50 years after its founding. When she was 52 years old, Susan B. Anthony finally marched into a polling place and cast her vote in an American presidential election. It wasn't because an amendment had finally been passed giving women the right to vote, for the year was still just 1872. It was because, with commendable courage and daring, Anthony had decided to put the 14th Amendment to a test, and at the same time make a public statement about the status of women. After she voted, she was arrested, and later taken to court and tried for violating the Constitution of the United States. She faced an all-male jury and a male judge. As it turned out, it wouldn't have mattered if the jury had been male or female. After he heard her case, the judge pulled out a statement he'd written even before hearing the evidence, and then directed the jury to find her guilty. Anthony demanded that he submit the case to the jury for its own verdict, but he refused, and then passed sentence, a $100 fine. Now it was her turn to refuse. Anthony told him she wouldn't pay even a dollar, and she never did pay. No further action was taken against her, because the trial had already gained national attention, and the judge wanted to avoid further publicity. Anthony worked so hard in her cause that she didn't take her first vacation until she was 63 years old. Then she went to Europe, where she found herself famous, and received numerous requests to lecture. She was particularly well-received in England, where the feminist movement was almost as strong as America's, thanks largely to the efforts of Emmeline Pankhurst, and before her, John Stuart Mill. Mill had been unsuccessful because his female sovereign, Queen Victoria, was staunchly opposed to the woman's movement. At the age of 70, Anthony gave in to her sister Mary's request that they make a home together in Rochester, New York. Mary had just retired as a schoolteacher, and both sisters owned a house in Rochester as part of their inheritance. Neither had enough money to furnish it, however. So, the Political Equality League of Rochester, in honor of Anthony's efforts on behalf of women, furnished the house as a gift and a tribute. Anthony, however, saw little of the house. Even as she grew older, she was seldom at home, so busy was she with lectures and campaigning. Finally, at the age of 80, she retired as the president of the Suffrage Association and focused on finishing her monumental book. In that book, she emphasized her final and to her most important point. American women must get the vote through an amendment to the Constitution, not through state laws. The states were too slow and too fickle, and the issue was too basic to human rights. What Anthony wanted was a 16th Amendment, which would read, in her words, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the account of sex. In 1904, women's rights went to a global level when the International Woman Suffrage Alliance was formed. The members automatically acknowledged Susan B. Anthony as their leader, even though she was then 84 years old. Two years later, she attended what she intuited would be her last convention and said to the delegates, The fight must not stop. You must see it does not stop. That same year, she attended a dinner in her honor in Washington, D.C., and finished her speech by saying, Failure is impossible. She was one of the few who believed it. When she died on March 13, 1906, as a result of a cold she'd caught on the visit to Washington, she was eulogized as the champion of a lost cause. But a cause doesn't always end with a life of its champion. Thirteen years later, an amendment giving women the full rights of American citizenship was added to the United States Constitution. It was Amendment Number 19, but it was called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. It was passed in 1920, exactly 100 years after her birth. Sixty years later, in 1980, when women were still struggling for equality in other arenas of life, the United States government minted one-dollar coins bearing her image, the first woman ever to be pictured on an American coin. Because of her relentless 50-year campaign to emancipate women, Anthony is sometimes called the Napoleon of Feminism.
Her ceaseless work and exhausting travel brought recognition and respect to women's issues in both America and Europe. There were many countries that had given their women the right to vote before the United States finally did. New Zealand was one of the earliest, in 1893. Over the next few years, Australia, Finland, and Norway followed suit. In the early 1900s, the emancipation of women occurred swiftly in one country after another. Russia, Canada, Germany, Austria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and then finally the United States in 1920. The last remnants of opposition had broken down after women had played a major and critical role in World War I, both at home and overseas. After the United States granted women the right to vote, suffragette movements in still other countries gained momentum, and women were soon voting in Great Britain, Burma, Ecuador, South Africa, Brazil, Uruguay, Thailand, Turkey, Cuba, and the Philippines. After World War II, France, Italy, Romania, Yugoslavia, and China joined the group. Then India and Pakistan. In another decade, the total had reached more than 100. In a period of a little over 40 years, most of the civilized world had overturned a social system that had endured for thousands of years. Except for some of the Arab nations bordering the Persian Gulf, women today have voting rights in almost every country in the world. Nowhere was there a stronger, more united example of the struggle for women's rights than in the United States. No movement in history so radically altered human relationships and the structure of society as the movement for women's equality. And nowhere was there a leader who personified the determination and courage of that movement more than Susan B. Anthony.